Good day, everybody. Um, my name is Megan Sullivan. I'm a registered dietitian with the Hamilton Family Health Team, and I'm joined by my colleague, Kate Park, today, who's also a registered dietitian uh, with the Hamilton Family Health Team. We're here today to talk to you guys about uh, a topic that comes up in clinic with us sometimes, especially since COVID, uh, around parenting, food, and kids. And pa parents have found they have new challenges since being home, maybe with their children all the time. Um, so we're just going to go through some um, strategies for dealing with kids when it comes to snacking and feeding. Okay, so has COVID affected the foods you have at home and the foods you offer your children? Has there been any change in routine in the foods that you have available at home? Has there been any changes here? So, you know, is the family snacking more, reaching for more comfort foods because this is, has been quite an unusual and trying time for a lot of us? Are people getting tired of home cooking all the time since we're staying home more often to stay safe? These are some things we're going to chat about today and how we deal with our children and these things. So a lot of the changes that have happened in our lives since COVID, you know, lots of stress. I hear lots and lots of people talking about the stress related to COVID, the anxiety around it, worries as parents, you know, about our children getting sick or how to keep them safe during this unusual time. A lot of people dealing with a loss of income, which can affect, you know, how we eat, what foods we're able to keep at home and how we nourish ourselves and our children, which leads into food insecurity, COVID fatigue. So kind of just getting tired of the whole COVID pandemic and all the variables that come along with that, staying home more often and also less activities for children. So less ways to keep kids days more diverse with more things to keep them entertained. So they're at home more often. So is snacking okay for kids? And the answer is absolutely. Snacking is actually very important for children because snacks provide additional nutrients for tiny tummies. So because kids are only able, because of their small stomach, to eat small amounts at meal times, we need those snacks to top up their nutritional value by the end of the day. So snacks are actually very vital and important to kids' growth and development. We typically recommend that you schedule snacks between two to three hours apart to allow time for your child to be hungry. So we don't want them to fill up by grazing all day long, then they're not hungry enough to eat the good nourishing, maybe not as overly accepted foods when you offer them. So you find that two to three hour window throughout your day between meal and snack time is a great schedule to follow with children to be able to fit in all the variety of food groups. And you'll see over to the left here, a sample meal plan that we've thrown in here to show you what the day might look like for kids. So starting off with breakfast, very, very important meal um, with some whole grain toast, cooked egg, banana milk. So as you work your way through the day, you'll see that all the different food groups are hit to give balanced meals and balanced snacks. Ends up being three meals with three snacks for most children who are awake between 12 and 14 hours. So one of the things that we can't stress enough and is probably one of the biggest challenges for a lot of people during COVID is sticking to a schedule. A lot of us have had our schedules kind of turned upside down, um, either due to job changes, changes in how schooling is being managed, maybe whether or not you're sending your child to daycare. Um, but our bodies at any age thrive on a schedule. The schedule for sleep, a schedule for eating, a schedule, routines really do help both mental and physical health. So it's very important to try and keep that schedule around healthy eating as much as you can. One, it's going to help reduce stress. It's also going to take some of the thought out of it. So if you know there's regular snack time, regular breakfast, lunch, and dinner times, um, it's easier than trying to, you know, plan around everything and have your schedule all over the map. Um, and that routine that you give to your child also helps to reduce anxiety around food. Many children that we'll see um, well, where there's eating problems, sometimes a lack of routine is a really big part of the core issue um, because they're never quite sure when they're going to be getting food. And if you're offering regular food at regular times, often that allows the child to feel more secure, eat what they feel comfortable with, knowing that the next meal or snack is coming at a regular time. And just like the grown-ups, kids can get bored during the day if there's not a lot going on and can use food as a source of entertainment just as much as we can. 
Um, so they may actually end up asking for food when they're not hungry. And the best advice we can give here is just like we would recommend with our adult patients um, is try to recognize when you're eating out of boredom as opposed to hunger. So it's perfectly okay if your child's coming up and asking for food, say immediately after a meal or after another snack to say, you know, it's not snack time right now why don't you go do, and then kind of another activity that maybe they'd still find engaging, and then we'll have a snack after, right? So again, sometimes they're looking for a snack because again, it's something entertaining. Let's face it, food's enjoyable, it's designed that way. Um, but we wanna try and stick to that routine as much as we can. Um, so, you know, if you have your breakfast set at eight o'clock and you have a snack set for 10 o'clock, but your child's asking at nine o'clock, maybe offer them another activity, say like a coloring book or crafts or their Legos, and then reassure them, you know, snack time's still gonna be at the regular time and you'll have an opportunity to have something then. Um, another thing that's not unusual is that, uh, children and adults can both mistake hunger for thirst. So if there hasn't been enough water consumed, sometimes they might feel hungry. So offering water in between meals just to make sure they're staying well hydrated can also be a way to tame um, hungry tummies uh, that may not actually be hungry. And I guess the overall message here is that we wanna make sure that we are not grazing all day and that we're having regular meals and snacks. Because if we're grazing all day, it's very hard to make sure we're eating a balance of those foods that we need in a day. As you can see here on the side, we have this image from the new Canada's Food Guide of what a balanced meal might look like. So ideally half of our plate is coming from fruits and vegetables, a quarter of our plate is coming from proteins, and a quarter of it is coming from our grains and starches. Um, uh, typically the guideline is you wanna use about the size of a hand for kids. Remember that um, as adults, we may eat larger portions, child have tinier tummies, so we would offer smaller amounts. Um, and of course, if they're still hungry and wanna go back for seconds, we do need to respect that, but we don't need to assume they need to eat the large amounts that we would typically eat. Um, and in particular, that balance is really key. So again, looking at whole grains, proteins, and fruits and vegetables together. And more importantly, we wanna make sure that we're eating mindfully. This is actually a concept they talk about a lot with the new Canada's Food Guide, the idea that um, not only what we eat is just as important as how we eat. Uh, so with all the technology that's available, many of us may try to multitask while eating. And this distracts us from what we're experiencing from our food. And we may not actually recognize when we're full or hungry. And we may not necessarily get the full enjoyment out of the food. So if you want to eat in the healthiest way possible, we recommend removing all distractions. So, you know, turn off the TV, turn off the cell phone and the iPad and eat together as a family. There's significant research that eating together is both beneficial for us physically and that we tend to eat better quality meals when we're eating with others, as well as mentally. Generally, things like anxiety and depression tend to be lower in children when we eat together as a family. It's also a good way to socially engage. It's bonding time with your family. And then also it's very important to eat slowly and chew our food well. Um, you know, with how busy the world uh, can be, sometimes we can rush a meal quickly because we needed to get to the next activity. And often if we're eating very quickly, it gives us an opportunity to end up overeating. And if we're not chewing our food really well, it can actually increase indigestion. You'd be surprised for how many, for a large number of people when they're experiencing a lot of gas and bloating after meals, just slowing down and chewing food more thoroughly can actually reduce those symptoms significantly. So you may wanna try this at home for yourself. Another really important concept is make sure that when we are choosing foods to put on our child's plate, that we are choosing things that are higher in fiber from whole grains and also vegetable fiber. Fiber. So as an example, the pictures on the slide here, you'll see you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with white bread, as opposed to the other side, you have much more balance here, especially relating to that portion of the food guide that Kate was discussing earlier whole grain bread in to almost double to triple the fiber compared to white bread. And then you have half, a uh, half of the plate with some fruits and vegetables, which also increases fiber. 
Fiber is very important for a lot of health reasons, but also in children, it helps to keep them feeling fuller longer. So if you're finding your child is asking for a lot of snacks and you think hunger is coming on too quickly after having a meal, they're gonna, they should have a lot more satiety from the picture on the right compared to the picture on the left. So look for different ways in your child's day and the whole family's day to increase the fiber content at your meals and snacks. So really important in uh, principle when feeding children is that we really encourage parents to allow their children to decide whether or how much to eat. Quite often as parents, we take over the responsibility of if the child eats or how much they eat. And this can come, this can create some tension at meal and snack time, some stress if you're trying to coax or encourage your child to eat more. We definitely encourage parents to pick where their child eats, so at the table, like Kate said, and to set up that schedule we've talked about. But once you have a good schedule of every two to three hours having a meal or snack aligned, and then you have it at the table without distraction, and you put that balanced meal in front of your child or that balanced snack, it's then up to the child if they're going to eat or how much they're going to eat. Mm -hmm. um, this approach can reduce stress at meal times once the parent doesn't feel as responsible for how much the child ate. You also then know that you have a meal or snack following in two to three hours where you can offer some more nourishment again. So you don't need to be worried about the child not getting what they need. Having this too, you give them a sense of their own hunger and fullness cues and it tends to build a better relationship with food and healthier eaters if children are given that opportunity to eat when they feel hungry and stop when they feel full. Um, you also want to be considerate to children, but not cater completely. So you don't want to always cater, you know, peanut butter sandwich all the time because that's what Timmy likes to eat. But again, we wouldn't suggest offering a whole meal of foods that are unfamiliar or haven't been accepted by your child before. So if the child never likes salmon, rice and broccoli, we wouldn't suggest you plan that as a meal for dinner. However, if most of the family likes salmon and rice, I would suggest planning that for dinner and ensuring the third thing on the plate is something that your child really likes to eat. So that way you're being considerate that you are offering something that's accepted by the child already, completely catering every meal to their selective preference of foods. And all foods can fit within healthy eating. You know, stress, anxiety levels are high during COVID-19, which can impact our food choices. Some people look to food for comfort and children may do this too, or for entertainment like Kate mentioned earlier. And we don't wanna have foods to be completely off limits. You know, sometimes that can create an, um, a situation where a child then will want and crave, say, sugary or salty things more because they're never allowed. So try to be flexible um, with certain foods that are higher in sugar and salt. So, for example, you know, if your child loves cookies, offer them in rotation with other foods. So perhaps, you know, the morning snack a couple of days a week can be a cookie with a yogurt or something like that. We encourage more of a 20, 80, 20 approach or strategy to these kinds of foods you know, 80% of the time offering well-balanced, whole nourishing foods, 20% of the time we can have some more of those soul foods, we like to call them. Um, things that are maybe not be as healthy, but you know, we really enjoy and are part of a healthy diet anyways, in a certain amount. And another idea, you know, if the child loves cookies to make some homemade healthy cookies together, gets them involved in the kitchen, they feel a sense of pride over making them, and then you know what kind of ingredients are in those treats as well. Another really important thing with kids is how we word things when it comes to meal times and foods. And children, especially as they grow older, I find around 18 months, they really like having choice. And although we don't recommend that you always give the child the choice of what they're going to eat all the time, you can give options. So for example, you want your child to have a vegetable, you can give them the option of a vegetable. So instead of saying, would you like broccoli, you may get a no quicker than if you say, would you like peas or broccoli? I also find that children, if they choose what the vegetable is going to be, you may have more success with them actually eating it at the mealtime. And then they're also involved in their choices and what the family is going to have, which they quite like. That's a great point, Megan. It's a, it's a choice without a choice almost. <laughs> um, another thing that you can do to encourage kids to feel like they have a certain level of independence, but still encourage them to eat a variety of these uh, healthy foods is um, to build meals where they have the opportunity to choose things to be in it. So for example, uh, doing homemade burgers where we offer a variety of toppings like pickles, tomatoes, lettuce, onions, 
or a taco night or a build a sub night where there's lots of options for things they can put on, but the whole family is kind of sharing the same experience and eating the same foods. And the reality is there's a lot of pressure put on parents to excel at feeding their children, but every child is different and there's no such thing as a perfect diet. The fact is we are in the middle of probably one of the most stressful times of our generation. And the fact is that we're not seeking perfection. We just want to try and eat in a way that's going to take care of our health as best as possible within our circumstances. Ideally, we encourage people to try eating and cooking together as much as possible uh, in a time when so many of us are having to live apart or be at a distance. Take those opportunities when you're having food together to be together um, because those benefits about the food um, are not just about the food themselves, but it's also about building those connections and feeling connected to others. The other thing that I'd like to point out is often when we think about snacks, we think about the snack aisle at the grocery store and snacks don't have to come from the snack aisle. Snacks can also be things that um, are say like for mini meals. The real purpose of a snack, especially with children is to bridge the gap between meals with more nutritious foods that meet kids daily needs. As Megan was saying early on, it's very difficult for children to eat large amounts at once. So when you're eating small amounts more frequently, you've really got to maximize on getting those nutritious foods at every meal and snack, right? So you don't always have to go for the chips and cookies and crackers. Certainly those can be part of the snack options, but they could also be mini meals. For example, half a peanut butter and banana sandwich can work as a snack. Um, it can also be smaller depending on your child's appetite. If your child's quite young, a quarter of a peanut butter and banana sandwich might be enough for a snack. And you may find that sometimes a larger snack is needed and sometimes a smaller snack is needed. Kids will fluctuate um, in their hunger as they're going through their uh, different stages of growth. So how do you build a healthy snack? Well, the general guidelines would be to include at least two food groups. So uh, between grains and proteins and our fruits and vegetables and to have different colors and textures. Let's face it, food is not just about taste, sometimes it's how it looks. Um, so if we have lots of different colors and textures, it makes food more interesting. Uh, a saying that I've always had when it comes to fruits and vegetables is uh, mother nature kind of color coordinated our food and different colors give us different benefits. So if you're always eating the same color, you may be missing out on key vitamins and minerals. So it's always a good idea to mix up the colors when it comes to your fruits and vegetables. And beyond fruits and veggies, we also want to make sure we're incorporating whole grains, which are great for fiber, and lots of lean proteins like beans and nuts, meats and cheese. If you want some inspiration for some fabulous recipes, I would highly recommend checking out cookspiration.com. It's by Dietitians of Canada. There's lots of fun snack ideas on there that are kid approved. In fact, some of the recipes were actually submitted by kids themselves. Um, so I think you'll find there's a lot of fun stuff on there that you can do and actually make with your children. So that's, that's great. Thanks, Kate. So one thing we do want to do, though, is I, I don't know if instead of avoid, but we want to limit snacks high in added sugars and low in nutrients. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, limit sweet drinks such as juice, pop and sports drinks to just certain times and some certain scenarios. And instead, you know, offer on a regular basis in a regular kind of routine, water and milk, because water, you know, hydrates us really well and milk gives us key nutrients such as calcium, vitamin D, um, some protein. And we want to limit cookies and ice cream as a regular snack that you offer to your child. Um, and we do recommend you pair a sweet or salty snack with a healthier food. So as an example here, they have milk and cookies. So that's a snack that gives some nutritional benefit with the milk, but it also, you know, gives just some wholesome feeling. Milk and cookies makes anyone feel good. Um, very delicious, but not completely absent of nutrition. Um, and offer sweets in small quantities on a regular basis to send the message that they are normal foods and can fit in a healthy diet. So like I was saying earlier, we don't want things to seem too off limit. And then as soon as the child goes on a play date or somewhere where those foods are available, they kind of overindulge. And so it doesn't create a healthy relationship with food. Whereas an 80-20 approach tends to result in a more uh, healthy relationship with food. 
and offer snacks in fun ways. You know, kids are so full of joy and why we enjoy them so much. And so they would get a lot of joy out of cutting foods into fun shapes, you know, offering different colors and talking about the rainbow, let them be creative with their food a little bit. You know, this idea here of a nibble tray. So using an ice cube or a muffin tin with small bites of different foods in each section. So berries, cheese, whole grain crackers, cucumber slices, and they can snack from there with all the different colors. But again, you know, you're providing a well-balanced snack for the child, just makes it a little more fun for them. And add vitamin D to your snacks. So vitamin D can be a common deficiency here in Canada because we are so far north. It's limited in our foods and very limited in our sun from September to May. Vitamin D is very important for our bone health as well as reducing the risk of other various cancers. And, and it's also key for optimal immune function. So right now we all definitely want optimal immune function uh, with this pandemic happening. So we can get some from our food, uh, you know, so offering milk with a snack, add milk to smoothies, He's tuna melt sandwiches is another idea, you know, with the cheese on there. Uh, but you also may want to supplement your child, especially in those months of September to May, with 600 international units of vitamin D so that you know they're getting enough throughout the day. But we can get some from milk as well. And how much milk does my child need every day? It's recommended that children over the age of 24 months need, over the age of 12 months, need two cups of milk daily. If you're between 12 and 24 months, they need homogenized milk. Two and above, we recommend just whatever milk the family is um, drinking, except for the nut milks. A lot of those alternatives are very low in protein, so we don't recommend them. Um, however, fortified soy milk is an okay al alternative for kids over two years of age. About one cup of uh, milk here in Canada contains about 100 international units of vitamin D. And so if they're drinking two cups of their milk in a day, um, you're going to get 200 international units. When it's recommended, children get 600. So you may want to give them a 400 international unit supplement. Spread milk throughout the day for good absorption. Um, and like I said, avoid almond milk. You also, as, as important as it is to ensure your child's getting their two cups every day, we also don't want them to overdo that too much. We're to, you know, takes the position of other healthy foods that they need in a day. And some children, when they drink much, much too much milk, they get iron deficiency because the calcium blocks the iron absorption. So that two cups is very important, but not more than, more is not better always. All right, and that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, for anyone who is watching now, if you just want to fill out the polling questions, uh, we would really appreciate that. All right, thank you. All right, I think we can close the polls for now. <laughs> uh, if you are interested in learning uh, some more information, or if you have a very specific question you would like to ask us, the dietitians of the Hamilton Family Health Team are actually available directly by email. You can email your questions if you go to the website hamiltonfhc.ca, or I would recommend you book an appointment with your family doctor or dietitian. And if you're looking for more specific nutrient information, there's lots of great information on dietitians.ca as well as unlockfood.ca. We also have a ton of events coming up over the next while. We have a variety of classes we're offering. We have ones on heart health, diabetes, food and mood, self-care. A lot of these are pre-recorded on our YouTube channel. So if you go on YouTube and check it, uh, click Hamilton Family Health Team, you can get the full channel. Uh, I'd recommend you subscribe as we're constantly posting new information on there, um, as well as our Instagram channel also lets you know about events that are coming up. Uh, we also have a couple of popular groups that are open for the whole community, our Healthy You Lifestyle Group and our Diabetes Group that you can register for live classes where you have an opportunity to share about your experiences as well as a chance to speak with dietitians directly um, to get some great information. So be sure to check all of that out. Now, I'm trying to, uh, we don't actually have any questions in the live feed right now. Um, Megan, do you have any common questions you get around snacking or difficulty with offering variety at snacks with kids? 
Yeah, sometimes I find parents can get in like ruts of offering the same snacks over and over again. And in this day and age, I just find websites and the internet or even other moms and mom groups are really can be really inventive of different snack ideas, because we do want to stay in, inside of those four food groups as much as possible. Right. So we want to have some variety. I also suggest parents start picking up, you know, when you go to the grocery store, pick up a fruit you don't commonly pick up or have. And why don't the family try that together? You know, there's all kinds of options there for fruits and vegetables you may not have had before. Um, yeah, so, and also, you know, sometimes we can get stuck in ruts of snacks where the child demands the same snack over and over again. You know, they always want the goldfishies or whatever that may be. So I just tell parents, you know, don't completely avoid their favorite snacks, but you do want to pair them with something else that may be kind of new. So maybe pairing those goldfishies with jackfruit or another fruit they haven't seen before to kind of keep things interesting. Yeah, or incorporating them into uh, something else maybe that they're not as familiar with. There's actually a fun, uh, what I call it, a, almost like a trail mix I do with goldfish crackers where I add peanuts and slices of dried apple. And I actually find that mix still they're getting their favorite cracker, but it's also the sweet and salty with getting some peanuts and some other dried fruits maybe they haven't experienced. So again, like you were saying, kind of pairing the familiar with the unfamiliar. It's much like what we talk about when we're having difficulty at mealtime with kids that are maybe struggling to incorporate new foods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alrighty. Well, thank you everybody for attending today and, or watching it recorded on YouTube. Thanks for listening. See you thank next you time. Soon. Bye. Bye.